Okay, so you can see my screen, right, Beth? Yes, I okay. can see your screen. I'm awesome. Trying to... There. And actually, if everybody can turn their cameras off, that'll help with bandwidth and stuff. But if you have questions, put them in chat, please. Uh, Beth, you want me to, I think it'd probably be better for the folks that actually watch this after the fact, uh, if I just shut my camera off as well. It's just less, you know, um, Brady Bunch type of effect. <laughs> so gonna, That's fine. So I'm going to shut my camera off. So you can, re, you know, watch this later and not have me in here. All right. So tonight we're going to talk about time-lapse photography. But before we get started, just a tiny bit of housekeeping to get going. So I also teach workshops uh, in addition to presenting, and I also do photo tours. And I actually have a photo tour coming up at Acadia National Park in Maine uh, at the end of May. And this is probably one of my favorite places to shoot astral landscapes. I'm a big Milky Way photographer. And this place is eye candy for a photographer, whether or not you're a night shooter or not. It's just a magnificent place. So this is going to be soup to nuts. Hopefully, you know, ending each day with uh, shooting the magnific magnificence of the Milky Way. But during the day, it's just a photographer's playground. So if you're interested, I do have a few spots left. Uh, a few years, actually two years. A year and a half ago, uh, after being assaulted mentally by many people telling me that I had an unnatural obsession with lighthouses, I decided to write a book on lighthouses and with the hopes that it would be a catharsis. But anyway, it did not help that mania in any shape or form. But I end up, ended up creating a book that other lighthouse lovers could potentially enjoy. So this is available on hardcover and softcover editions, as well as on Amazon paperback. The fine art ones are printed on uh, high quality art paper. So if you, if you have a lighthouse fiend in your life, this might be a nice gift. In December, I released a book. It's a handbook on infrared. As uh, Beth had noted, uh, I am into infrared as well. And this is specific to the digital world of infrared photography. So if you're a longtime infrared shooter, this and you're still having issues or want to learn perhaps a way to, to, to um, sharpen your technique, this might help you. And if you are a novice or just thinking about infrared photography, this might peel away the many layers of infrared um, photography as a whole. So this is a handbook and it's available in ebook and also in hardcover co formats. And luckily, uh, well, not so luckily, unfortunately, you guys are so far from me. But if you're in the neighborhood in March and April, I have uh, photo walks at what a surprise lighthouses so I have one coming up at the end of the week at beaver tail and then I have another one at Ned's Point Light in April which is in Mattapoisett Massachusetts it's right at the probably considered like the heel of the cape and I have an infrared photo walk coming up as well in April and I teach Milky Way photography starting in May. I find that most people are not interested in coming out with me at 2.30 in the morning. So these start up in May when the galactic core is visible at a more reasonable hour. But I'm always open for people to join me at ridiculous hours. So this runs roughly May through October. And you can find me on your usual channels. Um, and that is my website. If you can't remember my name, which is not an easy name to remember, just think Roseanne, Roseanne Adana, or just ask Beth. <laughs> but you can find me everywhere. So let's talk about time lapse. It's one of my favorite things to do. So we're going to talk about a history of time lapse. I always like knowing where things originate from and how we get to where we are today. Why, as a photographer, you should consider shooting time-lapse? 
we're going to talk about gear, one of my favorite things to talk about. We'll talk about photographing a time lapse. There's a little bit of math involved. And then we'll talk about processing. So time lapse actually dates back to the 1870s when a British photographer by the name of Edward Mybridge captured the very first time lapse. What he did was he set up a sequence of cameras, 24, um, technically 24 cameras in a series, and he set up a, a method to trigger the shutter as the horse was going by. And what you're viewing is actually the time lapse that he created. In 1897, the ver very first feature film uh, w incorporated time lapse, and this was by the director Georges Milliers. In 1982, you, some of you might remember this, uh, it was a feature documentary completely shot in time lapse, and this was film, which was huge undertaking, and this was Koyonoskasi life out of balance. And this was followed by two others in the series. In my opinion, the very first one is the best out of the three. And recently, well, for a long time, nature documentaries have incorporated time lapse extensively because it gives us uh, insight into a world that we're simply not capable of seeing. If you've ever seen PBS's programs, Nature or Nova, or the BBC's programs, The Blue Planet or The Private Lives of Plants or Earth, they all use time lapse extensively. And it's a great way to get inspired to shoot time lapse if you watch these programs. Scientists also use time lapse to do document changes in the environment and um, crops and uh, forest ecosystems. And construction company that builds skyscrapers also use time lapses because it documents the building of very tall buildings, skyscrapers, which take years to create. The Solar Dynamics Observatory actually did a 10-year time lapse of our sun where every second that your view is actually 24 hours. When we look at the sun uh, through a telescope or even take a photograph of the sun with our camera, we see it as this flat, non-moving object. In reality, because of its, its, its enormous size, we're incapable of seeing its rotation. We can't see all of the activity on it, but time-lapse gives us a view into this. This is actually comprised of 425 million high resolution images taken over a span of 10 years with an interval of about almost six seconds, not quite six seconds. And if you wanna see the whole uh, time lapse, it's 60 minutes in duration and you can find it on YouTube, but it's pretty fascinating to, fascinating to watch. Yeah, you can actually watch the transit of the planet Mercury going across the sun and it's fascinating. You're actually looking at our sun in compressed time. Look at, look at all the, the uh, activity. It's uh, magnificent to watch. So if you're interested, definitely check out the YouTube um, video of it, 60 Minutes. This is uh, a sequence, and I'll let Sir David Attenborough narrate this piece. Hopefully you can hear we it. We often don't notice such dramatic behavior because to our eyes, it happens so slowly. But if time is compressed and you shift perspective to the plant's point of view, their world comes spectacularly to life. The events in this woodland can build to a view of half a year in less than a minute.
So we just watched six months of growth in a in a British garden. We can't see this, and this is the beauty of time lapse. So as photographers, why should you consider shooting a time lapse? Well, for one thing, is that time lapse is much easier now in the digital photography world. It is now obtainable to us. It's no longer this arduous um, technique that you have to do, you know, rolls of film and then put it all together. It's actually very easy. It also adds a new dimension to our photography. It allows us to visualize time passing because a time lapse actually compresses time. It allows us to see things that we are not capable of seeing real time. It speeds up things that appear to be happening very slowly, such as the Milky Way crossing the sky as we are rotating our Earth. Rather, the Earth is rotating. Shadows moving across the, the, the uh, horizon are actually during the day. And you can actually watch clouds forming and dissolving, which is fascinating to watch. Time lapse also has a 3D effect, which is very, very different than a lot of other things that you might watch in terms of regular video. This is a time lapse of a moon rising at a, what a surprise, a lighthouse. This was shot with a 500 millimeter lens on a super, super windy um, blue hour. As you can tell, the camera's actually kind of vibrating. But what's cool about it is you can watch people moving around. You can watch the moon rising uh, at a def very different speed than how we perceive it, which gives us an insight into a lot of things. Here's the Milky Way um, just doing its thing. You can see the, the clouds forming and dissolving and a lot of activity on the water itself. And a time lapse can be comprised literally of any segment of time. Fractions of seconds, seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years, and decades, as you saw with the Solar Dynamic Observatory time lapse of the sun, which was 10 years long. You can create a time lapse on just about any scene. Since there's a lot of things happening that we cannot see, time lapse reveals its activity. Some examples to get started with is photographing the clouds, wilted plants. That's a great one to, to get started with. Um, if I'm going to give you an example coming up, you can photograph the city streets. You can do a time lapse on tides. And ice cream, that's another one that's really good to get acclimated to photographing a time lapse. Here's a poor, pathetic New Guinea inpatient plant that had dried up. I mean, it was a very hot summer day. And this is 657 frames. It's 32 minutes in total shooting time. And you can actually watch this plant uh, come back to life. We know it comes back to life, a plant that's, you know, dried, um, needs water, and we know it, like, rejuvenates. But actually watching it over, uh, you know, a sequence of compressed time, it's fascinating to watch. Fog. We don't often think of fog as having any kind of force, but through a time lapse, you can actually see that it does have an impact. Um, on surfaces. This is almost 1,100 frames shot over a span of 50 minutes, and this is in Acadia. I often shoot time lapse, spirit of the moment. I often have a very large card in my camera, and if the, the, the scene um, suits me, I just start shooting a sequence of time lapse, such as I did at the Boston Public Garden on a summer day. As I said, I shoot a lot of Milky Way, and this is one of the first shoots that I did about almost a year ago. And you can tell there's a lot of air glow. The sky is very green, but you can watch the stars reflected in the pond. Um, there's a lot of things that you can observe that you totally miss real time. 
Time lapse can also reveal patterns or trajectories. You can observe things that happen in the traffic, watch how a plant grows, how lights move, how stars move, the weather patterns and clouds. Aurora is fascinating to watch in a time lapse. Even a volcano, if you're lucky or not lucky, depending on how you're, you're looking at it. Pretty much anything you can photograph with a time lapse and things start, start to emerge. Here's the skyline of Boston, that colorful building on the left. I've been watching this thing for years. Until I photographed the time lapse, I had no idea that there was a, a sequence to the color. It had a pattern and time lapse revealed this. This is the Zaken Bridge uh, in Boston as well. Uh, I think I was a dog in another life because I find myself photographing cars a lot, especially the taillights. Pemaquid Light in, in Maine. This is a sunset into blue hour time lapse. And I'm showing you very short sequences just to give you a flavor of what is uh, what you can do. Um, but time lapse can be much longer in duration, and um, the ultimate video are, are it can be much longer. But these are just small snippets to show you what what you can actually create. In terms of gear, pretty much anything will do. If you have a DSLR or mirrorless camera. And any lens pretty much will create a time lapse. You're good to go. A prime lens, a wide angle, a super wide, a telephoto, or even a super telephoto, as you saw with the moonrise at the lighthouse. You do need an intervalometer. This is what sets the timing between each frame. If you have a camera with a built-in intervalometer, you're pretty much good to go. But uh, if, your if your camera doesn't have that capability internally, definitely recommend getting a wired intervalometer. And this is also great for cameras that have a built-in intervalometer because it helps you extend the, the shutter speed. And we'll talk about more about that in a few minutes. You also need a, a, a very uh, capable and uh, strong tripod. If you have a travel tripod or something that isn't very sturdy, your time lapse will show its incapability. So make sure that you have a good tripod, a, a sturdy one to shoot a time lapse. And this is the beauty of an interval intervalometer. I can't speak English today. So as I noted, it allows uh, interval shooting on cameras that don't have that capability built in. You have fine control over time adjustments with one of these things. You can extend the sh camera shutter speed. Most cameras have a maximum shutter speed of 30 seconds, but this allows you to sh keep the shutter open for a much longer time. And it also helps uh, because it acts as a, a shutter trigger. So they, they're very inexpensive. Don't buy your Nikon or your Canon intervalometer, they cost 10 times as much. And if you step on one of these by accident, you won't, you won't cry. Um, these are about 20 bucks. And I recommend the wired version versus the wireless because if you're shooting a long duration time lapse and you run out of battery, um, either on the unit that's sitting on the hot shoe or the intervalometer, uh, you know, the uh, remote unit, then you're gonna have a problem because everything will stop. If you have a camera that has an intervalometer that's built in, you'll probably have a screen that's, that's similar to this. This is actually the Nikon intervalometer screen and each camera maker has probably a, the wording a tiny bit differently, but for the most part, it's interval something. So if you're not sure you have it built into your camera, check out your manual. But if you do, uh, you can kick off a time lapse anytime you want. You can also add an axis of movement. What do I mean by this? So if you have um, a panning head or um, a slider, 
you can add movement while the time lapse is being shot. For instance, this is the Syrup Genie Mini, and this is controlled by an app. And I set the controls in the app, and this actually fires my camera based on the parameters that I set it up with. I can also incorporate a slider and another unit, which is, this is the Syrup Genie. And what this does is it sits on top of the carriage and it moves the camera incrementally across. And I can pitch this thing at any angle. I can have it horizontal or pitch it uh, 45 degrees angle and it will move the camera in conjunction with this thing, which fires the camera. Another thing that's very important, um, you guys in Pennsylvania probably have the same amount of humidity that I have in New England. In summertime, uh, we have a very high dew point because it's such a soupy summer. If you're shooting at night or even during the day where the dew point is fairly high, you want to use a dew heater. When you're shooting a time lapse, you don't have the luxury of wiping the front element of your of your camera, of your lens rather, while you're shooting because you impart movement and that hoses the whole process. So these things are inexpensive. They're about 20 bucks. They, they wrap around the front end of your lens and they're powered by pretty much any power bank that you would use to, to keep your phone charged. And another thing that is very handy is a dummy battery with a unit that helps you can, uh, shoot long duration time lapses. One of the things that you become very cognizant about when you're shooting a time lapse is battery power. I get very neurotic when it comes to shooting very long duration time lapses, especially when I'm shooting the Milky Way. These are hours at a time and I wanna make sure that I have enough power at my disposal and have a, um, a clean time lapse. So there's ways of mitigating um, short battery life and you can do it with these little units here. Now here's a time lapse that's shot on a rail and I did not have my dew heater. Now notice the dew that's forming in the center of the frame. This is a three hour time lapse and it's basically hosed because of the dew. So don't be me. You can also slow down a time lapse. Time lapse, you can speed up, you can slow down. Here's an example of a time lapse where I uh, forced the time lapse to go very slow. Uh, so it's moving at a different rate as you, uh, rather than the ones that you saw before with the galactic core. Another thing of watching patterns. The, this is a bridge in Portsmouth, New Hampshire that has really pretty lights. And they're very slow moving, but the time lapse brings forth what's actually happening. You can also uh, film, or rather create a time lapse, which is actually a film in a matter of speaking, sunrise or sunset. This is actually in Death Valley. So you can experience the, the, the light changing at a higher uh, frame rate, a, a much faster speed. You can also shoot infrared time lapse. Uh, this is actually on a beach in the southern coast of Massachusetts in infrared, 720 nanometer. So how do you get cracking with this? How do you get ready to shoot? Well, like anything in photography, you have to figure out what you want to shoot, figure out what your subject is. For a daytime time lapse, you can create these in a very short span of time because you're using very short exposures. So you, within 10 minutes, you have a nice little time lapse at your disposal. So you set your exposure, you set the interval between each shot, and the number of frames that you're going to shoot, and you pretty much have a, a time lapse. 
a night time lapse, whether it's a cityscape type of time lapse or astral landscape, you're shooting the stars, this requires a longer duration shooting time because you're dealing with longer exposures. So for any type of night photography, generally speaking, you want to shoot for at least an hour and a half. So that's very different in terms of time to a day daytime time lapse. So let's do the math. This is probably the most difficult part of the process uh, in terms of un like wrapping your head around another dimension. And I mean that literally. One of the things that photographers, you know, we live in the instant. We live in a singular plane, so to speak, where we take a shot and then we move on. We don't think about um, a video or think about timing in the same way that a video, you have to think about a video. So we have to consider frame rates when we're, we're talking about time lapse. So we borrow things from the video world. So a video or a movie has a frame rate between 24 to 240 frames per second. That's literally uh, 24 photographs or 240 photographs in a single second of time. So this is where the frame rate comes in and this is where you have to think about how you're gonna be processing your time lapse. So since for time lapse videos, we're taking individual shots at specific intervals and then um, incorporating them into a video using a specific time um, frame rate, this is where a calculation comes into play. So the, the rule of thumb is this, you need to have at least 10 seconds of video in your final time lapse. Anything less, you leave your viewer unsatisfied. It's not long enough to be a satisfying type of uh, video for yourself or a viewer that's going to watch your time lapse. So what I recommend is I make it nice and easy. So two, for 30 frames per second, you can also use 24 frames per second. You need 300 images for a 10 second video. If you're using a 24 frame per second frame rate, you're gonna need 240. So I tend to always use the 30 uh, frame per second time um, frame rate only because it's easier to keep the numbers straight. So keep that in mind. So 10 seconds is your minimum amount of time lapse. So in terms of reference guides, this is a quick and dirty reference guide. So if you're photographing the city, you have an interval of one second between each frame. You're gonna shoot for two and a half minutes to create a 10 second time lapse. Not a lot of time at all. If you're shooting cumulus clouds, now you have a two second interval between each frame and now you're shooting for 10 minutes and so forth. If you're shooting high cirrus clouds, now you have a longer duration because the perception of those, those high level clouds, they're moving slow, relatively speaking. So you want a, a bigger gap between each frame. Um, so you're gonna shoot for at least 25 minutes. What I tend to tell folks is use these reference guides with a grain of salt. Ultimately, it's how you want your video to look. I like my videos to be very smooth looking and um, the longer the gap between each frame, the more of a choppy look it can impart. So just keep that in mind. So use these reference guides with a grain of salt. You adjust it to your own likes and desires in terms of your video. You can also shoot a pregnancy, a shot a day for 300 days and you'll get 10 seconds of video. So the duration, the interval time can be as long as you want um, and the time required also goes hand in hand, but the goal is the length of time in the final video. So it's three elements here. Here's another cross-reference that you can look at. 
And again, these are really great to help you um, get a feel of timing between each frame. Again, take it with a grain of salt. I can tell you for um, my star photography, I'm looking at my shutter speed plus two seconds for the interval. So I have probably an interval of two seconds between each frame and you shoot for hours at a time, but you end up with a very smooth looking time-lapse. I'll be sending out notes uh, to you, um, Beth, and you can share it with the group. But again, use this as a guideline, but not the gospel alternate to your own likes. There are also great tools out there that helps you get a feel of how long you're gonna shoot and so forth. And these are free and they're very handy. I have this particular one, <clears throat> actually this one, time-lapse calculator. And what you do is you give it the number of uh, time for the interval. So for this example, I put in five second interval. I'm gonna be planning to shoot two and a half hours. And it's telling me that I'm gonna be uh, generating 1800 frames. The resulting clip using a 30 frame per second frame rate is gonna give me a, second, a 60 second video. So I got a full minute with shooting at two and a half hours with an interval of five seconds. Another thing that's very helpful is you have to be very cognizant about your, your uh, memory cards. So I put in the size of my sensor, 47 megapixels, megabytes rather. And I know that for this particular shoot, I'm looking at about 80, almost 85 gig. So these tools are very helpful especially at the beginning of your journey into time-lapse because it, it wraps your head around another dimension of thought. So these are very helpful. Then once you have everything set up, you need a comfy chair, a couple of snacks, and maybe a nice beverage. And yet you, you let your camera do the heavy lifting. You just let it do its thing. Things to keep in mind when you're shooting a time lapse is you want your tripod level, especially if you're using a, a panning head. You don't want your panning head to nosedive your camera because your 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 tripod's out of level. So make sure your tripod is spot on level. If you're using a DSLR, make sure that you cover the eyepiece or put a piece of gaffer tape on the eyepiece so you don't have any stray light coming in and messing up your shots. Set your exposure and make your adjustments that needed. I highly recommend using neutral density filters to help slow down your shutter. Once you set your focus, switch the camera to manual focus. There are some cameras that will try to focus for each frame and that will mess you up. So I always get into the habit, even though my camera doesn't do that, I always get into that mode of once my focus is locked, I switch my camera or the lens itself to manual focus. So either, you know, something can happen, I just wanna be safe. Set the interval between each frame, either by your in-camera intervalometer or one of the handy dandy external, ex intervalometers and make sure your memory card is big enough, especially for long duration time lapses. Thing to remember, the shorter the interval, interval between each frames, the smoother resulting time lapse. That's why I tell folks to think about what your goal is. And the shorter the, the, the time, the smoother the time lapse. Think of time lapses that you have seen of perhaps plants growing or buildings being built, they have a tendency to have this choppy look to them. And that's because the light changes between each frame and the resulting clip ends up looking kind of choppy looking because of the change in ambient light. Time-lapse tends to look better in landscape mode, but by all means, shoot it in portrait as you saw the 
um, the time lapse at Pemaquid Lighthouse in Maine. That was shot in portrait mode. Adding an, uh, an additional axis of movement adds visual interest. Always shoot raw and in manual mode. The thing about aperture priority is it can result in flicker, and we're going to talk about that in detail. And time lapse of sunset into night or night into sunrise re requires bulb ramping. I get a lot of questions from people asking, you know, they want to dive right into the sunrise, you know, the, the, the change of uh, night into day or day into night. And that is very involved, not that easy. So start slow and then build up to bulb ramping. The 180 degree shutter rule. This comes from the our friends in the video world. And this is a great rule of thumb to have a very smooth looking video. And basically it's this. Determine the frames per second that you're going to uh, use in post-processing either 24 frames per second or 30 frames per second. And this is the fastest shutter speed that you're gonna be shooting uh, your shutter is going to be at when you're shooting your time lapse. So at 24 frames per second, the correct shutter speed is about a 50th of a second. If you're shooting at 30 frames per second, the 180 degree shutter speed would be 1 60th of a second. And then the reason is this, if you go higher in shutter speed, there's um, a jitteriness to the output of the video itself. And this is why neutral density filters come in very handy because you can slow that shutter, shutter speed down to a very um, natural looking video. Notice this ice cream melting. This is, actually has a flicker to it. And this is shot in aperture priority. And you get a flicker when you use aperture priority because every time the camera is uh, tripping the shutter for you, it's actually opening the blades of the lens and bringing it back down. Now, every time it does that, the blades of the lens are never in the exact same spot. So even though the, the shutter speed uh, has not changed, or the ISO has not changed. The blades of the lens has changed and that brings in more light or less light. And when you put this together in a time lapse, you end up with a very choppy flicker look to your video. Now, some cameras, uh, the Nikon has a exposure smoothing setting that you just set it in your interval timer shooting and it mitigates that. It actually prevents the blades of the lens itself from opening and closing. It just keeps it static and you won't get that um, jittery flicker in your time lapse. The beauty of time lapse is it's also multi purpose. Here's a time lapse that I shot at a wetlands near my home, and I was photographing the uh, fireflies. You can see them flitting around on the tops of the grasses. With a time lapse, you can stack it in post processing. You end up something like this. So I got all of the fireflies as well as star trails in a single frame. So I just put them all together. I stacked them. Here, what a surprise, a lighthouse. I told you I have issues. Um, this is uh, Situate Light, and I'm photographing um, stars, literally. And I put them all together and got a star trail image. I had selected Polaris, I had positioned Polaris, rather, in the top right portion of the top of the lighthouse. So when I stacked the images, I got circular um, star trails around the lighthouse. So a time lapse has many purposes. Now the lighthouse, I have issues. Well, one of the things in New England that we suffer a lot of is bad forecasts. Clouds are the bane of my existence. That was supposed to be a clear night. But when you're handed lemons, you make lemonade. And I ended up stacking the images. So I got kind of like a, a brushstroke painterly effect of the, of the sky 
uh, when in reality it should have been clear. But anyway, you get what you you do what you get. <laughs> so let's talk about post processing. One of my favorite tools for po post processing is LR time lapse. In my opinion, it's the gold standard. Uh, it works hand in hand with uh, Adobe Lightroom and it runs on Windows and Mac. And it works very seamlessly. It actually um, does a lot of work in terms of mitigating exposure, balancing exposure, and doing a lot of great things. You can use it, uh, download it, and use it free for up to 400 frames. And beyond a uh, time lapse uh, that has more than 400 frames, then you'd have to purchase it. There are many other tools as well. If you're on a Windows machine, you can use Corel's Video Studio um, or Windows Video Editor. This is actually part of the Photos app on a Windows machine. If you're on a Mac, you can use Final Cut Pro or iMovie. And there's a lot of tools as well that are open source that can also create a time lapse for you. And basically any software which allows you to set the duration between each frame, actually the duration of, of, of each frame, can create a time lapse for you, a time lapse video. And add production value. You just created this beautifully baked cake. It's perfectly baked, it's very tasty, but it's kind of plain. Just like a cake that you spent a lot of time baking, you want to make it pretty. So you put it on a pedestal. You embellish it with some uh, pretty frosting. You add production value. And this also applies to your time lapse. Stitch multiple time lapses together. Adds titles or a sign track. And a lot of video editing pro programs also have included music, so you don't have to buy any music for, for your time lapse. There's a lot of websites on the internet that uh, you can get royalty free music for download and there's a lot, lot of free music out there as well. And all you have to do is make sure that you attribute the track in your title. So you give credit to the artist that created that music and you create a public, polished video. Let's see, I have to switch over to something else now. So hang on, I'm gonna show you what I mean. So which means I have to share again. And just bear with me. So this is what I mean about polished video. So think about the type of time lapse that you created and think about the music. How can, like we're, we're very visual photographers, we are an incredibly visual lot, but what enhances our visual creation is the, the audio element as well. It gives, it sets a mood. So consider that when you're putting together your time lapse.
as I had noted before, clouds are the bane of my existence, and they never get the forecast right, so such is my lot. Now, in that particular one, you may have noticed that there's a little bit of cloud stacking effect in the time lapse. And what I did was I did some uh, stacking in post, and then I brought it into the time lapse tool to create the time lapse itself. So there's a little bit of extra work in that one where I'm stacking and then putting the, the time lapse together. So there's a lot of things you can do creatively with your time lapse. was the Comet Neowise that I spent the entire month of July chasing in 2020. Now, for this particular time lapse, I have a tendency to shoot double fisted, sometimes even three cameras simultaneously. And I shot the Milky Way with a normal camera as well as my, my infrared camera. And then I combined them together in the time lapse video, the, the post production. Time-lapse is just not relegated to that single sequence that you shot. You can combine other things such as stills as I did in this particular uh, sequence. So think about, you know, be creative. Don't limit yourself. Experiment as much as you can. You'd be surprised what happens. Here's one. Now for that sequence, I have a tendency to get derailed a lot. I always ask myself questions like, what if? What if I, could, what if I do this? Or what if I do that? So in that particular sequence, um, I got 
I don't know, I got inspired by applying a topaz impressionistic filter to it and then applied it to each frame and then assembled it in the time lapse. And I ended up with that. I'm sure you've seen the, um, I think there was a movie or an exhibit where they had a Vincent van Gogh um, video that had kind of that painterly effect. And that's what reminded me of that. Aren't you? I was obsessed with lighthouses. And that is that. So I hope I gave you some examples of what can be done with the gear that you have. Um, there's so much you can do with these digital cameras. And if you have a DSLR, do not be worried about your shutter. Believe it or not, your shutter can take hundreds and th upon thousands of frames before your shutter goes out. And after all my time lapses, I have never had a camera fail with the shutter. And if you have a failure, believe it or not, it's the most inexpensive thing to fix. So don't be worried about shutter attenuations because it's, it's honestly a non-issue. So have at it. <laughs> I think even my camera, which is like, nine years old now, I think it's got a built-in intervalometer. So if mine does, and mine's a Pentax, so they're not like super high tech, but mine's got one. So yeah, you can do time lapses very easily on the fly. And even if you, you don't have one built in 20 bucks, just put in your camera bag and they do the trick. So have any questions? Anybody oh, still awake? <laughs> I, I, yeah. Oh no, we are. I have a uh, a couple of Olympus uh, E series cameras from about two thousand three, two thousand two. One is an E ten, the other is an E twenty. And I thought that it did have an intervalometer. It does have time lapse built into it. Yeah, I just picked up the book and found where it was. Nice. That's good to know. Now that camera there, um, and most cameras that have the capability of creating a time lapse internally, what it does is it takes all your raw images, creates the video for you, and then spits out the video. Now, most of them will delete all the raw files. So if your mm -hmm. ca camera has the capability of doing what your yours does, excuse me, see if it has mm -hmm. Uh, like a checkbox on keeping the the original images because that way you can run amok kind of like the Silvana way where I I apply filters to the individual frames and I go off the rails I I you know put them together I stack them and then put together my time lapse so that's the value of having each individual frame it's and it's also a good way to cut your teeth on a time lapse getting mm -hmm. started because if your camera is capable of doing a time lapse, you get into that mind frame of setting intervals. And I have to say for photographers like us, it's the hardest thing to wrap your mind around is that extra element of time. We're not singular anymore where 
it's an aggregate. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it says uh, you can use it in uh, program A, S, or M mode. So I was concerned about what you were saying about the flicker that might yeah. occur. Um, I don't know. I've never actually tried it before, so it'll be a first for me. Uh, what I was going to say, though, is uh, this particular technology, this camera used a, uh, a split prism finder where a part of the uh, light goes through to the sensor and some of it's directed up to the prism finder at the same time. So uh, having the uh, rear aperture closed, the shutter, the eyepiece, having the eyepiece closed is probably critical yes. to light not coming in because it's always on. Yeah, you definitely mm -hmm. have to cover that because when you shoot time lapse, you don't have the camera up to your face. So you're not preventing light from coming in. Mm -hmm. So um, if you have a piece of gaffer tape, just put it on there and you're good. Some cameras have like a little lever that actually has a built-in cover in inside. So yeah. yeah, definitely cover it, whatever it takes to to prevent that stray light coming in. It'll, mess, mm -hmm. it'll gum up the works. Yeah, it has a switch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Cool. I don't know if you've ever heard of a Brino. Spell it. It's, a, it's like a little, I don't know, it's about the size of a small TLR that all it does is do time lapses. Ooh. And my husband, the eternal enabler, got me <laughs> one several years ago. <laughs> I've only used it a couple of times, but you can, it basically is just an intervalometer and you set it for how long for the duration and how long for the the intervals and how long to go and stick it on a tripod and it goes. My kind of and, gadget. <laughs> yeah, it's, you don't really have an awful lot of control over the, like the exposure and post-processing and stuff. It spits out a video like yeah. Rex's camera, but it's, I've used it a couple times and it was kind of cool. That'd be fun to play with. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, this sounds like um uh was it Rex? His his uh camera where it'll just create the video for you. Mm -hmm. So you end up not having the individual frames. It'll just create the time lapse for you, or do you end up having the frames as well? I don't remember if you can save the individual frames on it. I I haven't used it in a while. I'm only a couple of times. I tried to use it the last time we had a partial eclipse here and it got cloudy. Always shoot, like, even with the clouds, because I, there's a, uh, for the past few eclipses, the, if actually the, the last one that we had probably in a year and a half ago, it was completely socked in. I had gone to shoot it. It was like a dawn eclipse and it was completely cloudy. And to my eye, I couldn't see the sun, but the camera saw the sun. And I have some pretty good uh, clip shots. So even if it's cloudy, get a long lens and shoot it. Don't don't stop, just do it. You'd be surprised at what the camera can see. Yeah. That's cool. But I, I wanna try one with soccer because they have here, it's a, the local club has like a a big complex sort of and they have a snack bar on one end that if there's a way to get on the roof I'd be able to see the different fields in different spots that each get used for different ages That'd and be cool. they play over about I don't know I think it's about three hours or so on Saturday mornings so if I set it up to do like every five minutes or something on a Saturday morning, it would at least get who's at what field and like the little ones and then the bigger kids and stuff like that. That would be a fun be project. Yeah. I just don't know if I can get onto the roof or not, but. Give somebody a hot dog or something. <laughs> <laughs> the president of the club has usually been my son's coach. So, and this oh, is the season coming up. So work on that. Yeah. That'd be something I bet you the parents would enjoy seeing too. Yeah. That's really cool. That's a great project. Okay, you're on it. Lighthouses back. down here. So 
Yeah, well, that's all right. Yeah, I, I think this too, uh, it just feeds my mania. So my apologies to you all for the load of, of lighthouses because I do it. And then as I'm watching going, ooh, I do have an, a natural <laughs> obsession. <laughs> so but they're good. There's nothing wrong with lighthouses. Thank you. Thank you. You're an enabler too. <laughs> yeah, I know. So does anybody do time lapses today? No? Anybody going to do time lapses now? <laughs> Hopefully. I do upon occasion. Awesome. Cool. What's I your guess. favorite thing to shoot for time lapse? Chipmunks and squirrels in my backyard. Cool. I usually I usually do it with a GoPro. Just set it out there and let it go. How fun. Yeah, they're cute. They're they're fun to watch and especially with a time lapse, it makes them even go faster <laughs> than they already do. <laughs> well, I was thinking of a uh, uh a project, uh, what could I do for a project and my wife in in her office has a, uh, I think it's called a, a Christmas plant or a Christmas, cactus? a Christmas plant, ca a Christmas cactus. And it's interesting. Uh, it's interesting the way it doesn't branch out like many plants do. What it does is each uh, leaf is born from the one before it as it goes out. And then when it gets out to a certain distance at a certain time and temperature, it puts out a flower. And so I thought, that might be a good one because it can be done indoors. Uh, it can be set up and left alone. That'd be a fun project. That'd be magical to Try watch. That. Yeah, plants growing are fantastic to watch uh, and and yeah. you know use on a, uh, for a time lapse project. Um, years ago, I started with the ice cream and the um, you know the plants in the summertime. Mm -hmm. they, they get dried up and look pathetic and pretty much dead and you give them a drink of water set up your camera and let it rip and you end up actually watch them come back to life and it's magical <laughs> that's cool yeah i don't know if i could do that one the ice cream wouldn't last <laughs> self-control get through the project you have to serve two exactly one to <laughs> eat one for the camera yeah yeah, but if you put a couple of drops of um, food coloring on it, and it oh, that'll really, take care of it. Yeah, and it prevent you from eating it, and you can actually watch it, um, you know, melt because the the food coloring yeah. actually accentuates the the uh, the movement. You can actually see it better with the color, especially if you're using vanilla or whatever, something mm -hmm. solid looking. But it's a great way to get acclimated to the concept of time lapse. But time lapse is addicting. So just be warned. Mm -hmm. It is an addicting type of photography. It's a lot of fun, though. A lot of work, you know, and the, and the post processing. But if you have individual frames, you can, uh, you know, make sure that everything is perfect on each frame and then put it together and you end up with something really cool. Do you tend to do batch processing? in Lightroom with stuff since they're all pretty close in exposure or do you do a lot that are individual? It depends, excuse me, on the project. If um, a lot like that, the video that I showed you with the effects, the impressionistic effects on the time-lapse, when I first put the time lapse together, because it was like early in the evening and there wasn't a lot of cloud action, it was actually kind of boring to me. And I decided to play. I started, um, I brought in one image uh, to, to play around with in terms of exposure and maybe bring it out uh, more detail. And then I, on a whim, I applied uh, Topaz Impression and I liked what I saw. And then it just went from there. And then I, I, I applied the initial adjustments um, prior to applying Topaz to all of the frames, exporting them all, and then bringing it into Topaz and applying that particular impressionistic filter on all of them. And then 
exporting it to LR time lapse and it put together the time lapse for me. So it depends upon what I'm what the what I'm actually shooting. Um, for the most part, if you're not doing the bulb ramping, meaning you're not dealing with extremes and exposure, say you're doing uh, a sunrise or a sunset into night, then you have the section of exposures that's very different from the rest of the night, then you can't do that where you, you do one and apply it across the board, your, your, your adjustments. That is more more work because you're dealing with a quality of light that's very different than say the Milky Way. So you have to be very careful with that end of things. But if you're using bulb ramping uh, and you're using LR time-lapse, what it is is you have that even exposure. So since the histogram isn't really moving, technically your, your exposure is the same, even though the value of light per se is different from the beginning to the end. Um, there's not, it's consistent. Now, the thing with LR time-lapse is if you have extremes in exposure, it, le it levels it out. It, it has a, uh, the ability to make your exposure even. So that's one thing that I like about LR time-lapse. Um, you do that in the tool, go to a uh, Lightroom, uh, apply all the adjustments and then export it back out. So there's a little dance involved, but it's a it's an excellent tool to get high quality time lapses. So how's that for a long winded answer? <laughs> good, very good. The good answer. It was a nice, pres beautiful presentation. Absolutely Thank beautiful. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Glad you enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. My favorite of the time lapses that you've done is the one on the beach. You've done it in regular and infrared, and I can't decide which one I like better, but that's, I think that one's probably one of my favorites. As you know, as an infrared shooter, you see things in infrared that your normal camera or eye cannot see. And I was actually shocked because it was a crystal clear, not crystal clear night that mm -hmm. night, but the infrared picked up the high level clouds and in the normal you know, normal camera, there were no clouds. It, it was absolutely clear, but the high level clouds were picked up by the infrared. And when you compare them side by side, it's fascinating to watch. That's why I tend to shoot double fisted all the time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm with you. I really love seeing the difference. I'm hard put to find anything about shutter speed in here though, that doesn't mention a uh, a shutter speed at all. I guess you just have to uh, decide which mode you're going to use. And uh, what do we do? We try to get a single frame that looks good and then use that as the criteria for the subsequent frames? Yes. Okay. So, yeah. So if you're, if you're using, um, keep in mind, you always want to have, uh, think about below, the shutter. Yeah. yeah. Below a 60. Yeah, below 60 or lower. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go higher than 1 60th of a second, then you can, it gets to be, have a jitter to it. It's not even a flicker due to the aperture, but it, there's, a, there's a jitteriness to the, to the uh, time lapse. So mm -hmm. the slower yeah. the shutter, mm -hmm. which is the 1 60th is your maximum shutter speed, uh, you can go slower, just don't go higher than that. And you end up with a very, uh, natural looking movement in your time lapse. All right. Use a use a neutral density filter that helps slow down the shutter. In in broad daylight, anyway. Okay. So starting with something that the light isn't going to change a lot is a good first project. Yes, absolutely. Don't dive into the you know the sunrise, or you know night into sunrise or day into sunset into night, that is more tricky. You're going to need a bulb ramping uh, tool. Either uh, use an app, like I use QDSLR dashboard um, on my either my phone, it's on Android, uh, or a tablet. And what you can do is you can change the, the settings of the camera on the fly. So you just keep an eye on the histogram because the, the light changes so fast. You have to make sure that 
the the settings that were applied for sunset now they're going to be junk once that the dark the darkness sets in so you have to adjust there's also tools that can sit on top of your camera and it'll do that adjustment sort of kind of for you but um start slow because that is not an easy thing to accomplish but once you you get accustomed to time lapse and understand the whole dimension of time, then that piece of it, you can concentrate on and master that as well. But again, a lot of my students go, oh, I want to do sunrise, you know, sunset into night. And I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> not yet. You got to you got to walk before you run. <laughs> Otherwise, you get frustrated and you just like don't do it anymore because it's not easy bulb ramping. But there's ways of doing it. It's all about exposure. Keep an eye on that histogram. Don't go by what the LCD tells you. So yeah, another mm -hmm. long-winded answer. <laughs> we have any questions in the chat? No, it's just me. Oh, okay. Yeah, they do add life. And I, I honestly, that's why I do time lapse because it's beautiful in a time lapse, the clouds. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. So. I think the rest of the group here would know the bog would be an awesome place to do a time lapse as long as you can keep people from walking around on the, the boardwalk. Does the there, boardwalk take? A little, like if somebody's yeah, moving yeah. around, it'll yeah, it's gonna mess things up. Yeah, yeah. But it's a cool spot. It's a a spot that had been logged, and it used to be all I think spruce or something. Although, I'm not sure it was actually spruce. I think they used to call something spruce that really wasn't. But it's this big bog. There's trees at the edges, and everything is like leaning over because. It's always windy the same direction, but there's usually clouds whipping by and it's kind of on the top of a mountain. It's a pretty cool spot. That would be real cool to shoot. One of the, uh, one of the uh, statements that you made about uh, the picture of the sun was that it took, uh, the, the uh, sample that you showed us was 10 years in the yeah. making, yeah. 10 years. That's dedication. That's 10 years. <laughs> and it was shot on a satellite um, that they had. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. And if you noticed, uh, one, uh, while uh, the, I had that sequence, uh, at one point, like you could tell the camera went offline or something, um, mm -hmm. but they got it back online. I don't know if something hit the satellite and it jumbled everything, and that's mm -hmm. what you saw, but that's 10 years. 425 yeah. million high resolution images. I forgot how many terabytes it that that took. Like 20 well, terabytes or something. Uh, I don't know I don't know about um the satellite frequencies because they're so ultra high, but uh, many many years ago when I was in the uh, military, uh we used HF communications high frequency communications and one of the banes of the high freak communications was that at certain times of the year i think it's like 6 or 7 year periods that the sun goes through that the noise just becomes so unbearable that communications is uh padded down to a minimum long range communications back in the HF days would just basically come to a stop. There would be periods of time when it would be blanked out. So it was interesting to be able to look at all those different flares that were going up there, because I think it's the flares that we see on the surface of the sun that caused those um, disturbances in the uh, radio frequency range. And my question was, uh, when you mentioned satellite disruption, that it could probably disrupt even satellite signals. Oh yeah, we're actually in uh, the solar maximus now. And mm -hmm. the that sun is... is very active right now and it takes out um, radios, um, you know, it, it takes out a lot of things. Uh, one of my apps, it's a solar app. It actually tells you of uh, downed 
um, you know, impacted radio frequencies. Um, and it happens all the time right now. Oh, I experienced it on the job. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. Yes, it is. Awesome. So make sure you shoot raw. Unless your camera has, you're going to do aperture priority and you, 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 you know, if you have a Nikon, you have exposure smoothing on that uh, in the setup and make sure you have that clicked on and never turn it off because it doesn't affect anything except aperture priority. It doesn't affect shutter priority. It doesn't affect manual mode, only aperture priority because of that opening and closing of the uh, blades of the lens. Well, um, the, I use a Canon system now, and it it shoots raw. But uh, in the early days, in the early 2000s, um, it was called raw, but it was listed as a dot tiff. So mm. it's called raw, but oh, I think, uh, no, it was uh, O-R, O-R-F. Olympus used what was called O-R-F. Beth, is that right? O-R-F, I think. Uh, but when it uh, was, yeah, yeah, it was called ORF. No, it did have. Okay, I thought it was just dot tiff. No, it's ORF. It did have raw file. Yeah. Uh, but in those days, I was using the tiff because the ORF was so slow to record each one of those frames, just out of the camera, was uh, a, a couple of seconds. Wow. Literally a couple of seconds. It was that slow. Uh, by the way, these uh, the I had one E10 and the other one was an E20, and the E20 was a, a is a five megapixel camera. So whatever I try with it, I'm going to be doing it with five megapixels. That works. <laughs> <laughs> I think it does. I was surprised what it could do. That's cool, though. Yeah, I, I, I like to see what you end up creating with that. <laughs> well, I'll be embarrassed to show it, but I'll try it. I'll see what happens. I'm going to have to wait to see that the plant is beginning to bloom because that's basically what it's going to be, right? About 10, 15 seconds of uh, video. Yeah. Your mm -hmm. minimum goal is 10 seconds. If it's mm -hmm. shorter, it's like you're like, okay, I want more. <laughs> yeah. Why bother? Yeah. Why bother? But the, the yeah. that's the that's the guideline. You want to have enough frames to create a 10 second video or more. Okay. Yeah. I'll give it a try. Awesome. Cool. See, I'm committed now. I'm going to have to put it out there. Yes, <laughs> you have an audience. <laughs> you have witnesses. <laughs> yep. Oh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, you know, once you wrap your head around that whole concept of video it's uh and timing but once you get there it's, it's a lot of fun then you'll mm -hmm. just it's it'll become an instinctual like anything else we do in photography it becomes second hand but that initial um attempt is bizarre to us so we just have to plow through it think about it and then become second nature but it is fun and it is super addicting yeah i can bet DL, you should try some at Art All Night. Art All Night. Well, yeah. We're doing some interesting stuff this year. Um, you've heard of the 48-hour film festivals they've had in the past? Mm -hmm. We're basically going to do something like that at the show, during the show. Oh. Um, the place we have has a bunch of uh, large... TVs like take nine 40 inch TVs to make one panel. They have a couple of those, and that's what we're going to edit wow. on and uh, show show the uh, video on. Ooh. It's going to be interesting this year. Wow. Well, you're uh, did I understand? I came in late, so you're in one of the uh, northern states and then one of the New England states, Massachusetts. Mass. Okay. Oh, I went to. 
school at uh, Fort Devens, Mass, back when I was in the military. Oh, wow. Near, near Worcester. I don't know if, if Fort Devens was uh, decommissioned, so it's no longer a, an active military base, but it was a, uh, a communications base right outside of Worcester. Worcester. Yeah. Did I say that right? You said it correctly. (laughs) Beth, you're from up there too, right? You know, that area. Well, I lived up there for a while. Wasn't originally from there, but the state police actually does their driving class at Fort Devens. They use the the old runways. Mm -hmm. That was, that was fun. Yeah, fun fact, my 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 brother and my father, uh, my family is in construction, a small company, family owned, and they did a lot of work up at Fort Devons. Mm-hmm. Don't remember what they did, but they they used to go off and to do projects there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a cool well, place. Uh, it's a nice uh, area. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, it was. Uh... It was a a uh, beginning school for communications. I went to uh, NSA for advanced training. But um, one of the things we did back when uh, I was at Devons is uh, the uh, we had a, a, a EM uh, concession, and the um, we'd have dances. And the remember, I'm a single guy now. Okay, this is from a long time ago. And uh, the, some of the one of the girls, they would have the girls schools up there in the Worcester area would be invited in and we'd go to the dances at the club, at the EM club. So. Huh. For social activity. How long were you there? Well, the training there was uh, like about six months. So after basic training. Uh, which was about four and a half, five months, then six months there, and then on to NSA, and then on to assignments. Wow. First assignment, Turkey. This is back in the days of film. I was already uh, loving photography, and uh, I have a a lot of collection from Turkey uh, on the Black Sea. If you are familiar with... uh, the geography up in that area. My station, my station was uh, in a place called Sinop, S-I-N-O-P, Sinop, Turkey. And uh, I have a lot of pictures of the coast and the rubble of the uh, forts and the castles and the uh, walls of the uh, cities Byzantine. in that area, the boats and the fishing, that kind of thing. It's a beautiful country. I was there in 2014. <clears throat> Loved Turkey. Very pretty area. Um, right. Um, landed in Istanbul and then went to Ankara. Then from Ankara, flew up to Sinop. There was a small air, air base there, military. There was a military air base at that time. We're talking like 1963, 1960, yeah, 1963. And then in 64, I was in Germany and spent some time taking pictures there and a time off. So two very interesting places, but mm. no time-lapse, <laughs> no time-lapse photography. Would have been difficult with film. <laughs> no, I was using a Pentax camera with the most, I think was a 30 ex- 36 exposure roll yeah. of Kodachrome or Ektachrome. You need yeah. at least 10 rolls of those to create a 10 second time-lapse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can't imagine trying to do it with film. No, yeah. and yet mm. they did until digital. You well, Moybridge, Moybridge did. Yeah, he did. Eighteen yeah. seventies. Yeah. I think eighteen seventy exactly is when he did that. And he he's from he was from uh, he was British, and he did that in California at a racetrack. Yeah. Now, did you say he used a sequence of cameras? So each one of those cameras was firing. Uh, a single frame yes of what a glass plate or a uh, what would it have been i wonder um i'm not sure probably a, a glass plate but he did it he he mm. set up 24 uh cameras in a, in series and mm-hmm. he set up a, a a a device that would trip the shutter as the horse went by 
fascinating stuff that he did this. Yeah. Yeah, it, it boggles the mind just to think about it. Yeah. We're spoiled to a degree <laughs> that is ridiculous, but yeah. Well, and I think <laughs> I think one of the things that his uh what motivated him, I think had something to do with he was betting that a horse at one point in the gallop all four hooves were off the ground. Uh, exactly. Wasn't that right? That's yeah. 100% right. Yep. That's what he wanted to prove. Yep. Yeah, and he wanted to prove also that a bunch of painters were painting them wrong and how they were running. And he was absolutely correct. <laughs> yeah. They did it wrong for a number of years, painted them wrong, how the legs were positioned. And that's why painters hate us. No, kidding. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I'm going to enable the lighthouse thing a little bit. My dad, up until recently, lived in Maine for about 20 years. And oh, wow. I'm yeah. super familiar with Pemaquid Lighthouse because my dad volunteered to give tours for a number of summers. Oh, wow. So, very familiar that's with awesome. Pemaquid and, and Bath area because um, he lived in Bristol, just a little bit north of Portland. So that's very familiar with the area. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah. One yeah. of my favorite lighthouses. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's exactly where it is. It's in Bristol. Chemical. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Way cool. Mm hmm. Lucky man. Yeah, he loved it. <laughs> loved it. I'm sure he did. I would have yeah. been wallowing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Way cool. So who's going to do time-lapse tomorrow? <laughs> I'm going to have to wait for that plant. <laughs> I, can, I can coax it. Well, if you do a frame a day, mm -hmm. you know, by the time, or yeah, a frame a day, you, you probably have a really good amount of frames to see it grow. Oh. Uh. You you know what you're making me think of something else. You you know in uh, Hollywood what a hot set is. Mm -mm. They call a hot set. A hot set is when there is filming that's been taking place, and you do not go in there and touch or move anything ah. until the entire sequence is done, because if you do. It's sort of like if you see two people sitting at a table and somebody comes in there, one of the prop people come in and they move a glass or something like that. And it's a two camera. It's a it's an A and a B camera shot. And you do the A camera over one shoulder looking at both of them and a B camera over the other shoulder with both of them. And as it goes back and forth, you see the glass move from one shot to the other. It's on this side of the table. It's on that side of the table. So on the, that kind of thing. Yeah. Sort of like when 007 went across the bridge with a damaged vehicle, and when he got to the other side, it was fixed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know? That's where they have continuity, that's, people. That's the violation of the hot set. Got it. Okay. Well, your 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 where your plant is is going to become a hot set. I was going to say it's in my wife's office, so I'm not sure I'm allowed in there once in a while. So you're going to be careful what I set up. <laughs> Maybe we can take it out and set it up somewhere else where it won't get disturbed. That'll be cool to, to shoot. Yeah. I'll give it a try. Uh, and I, all I can do is hope. No, definitely. Storms are great to photograph, too. Was it last year we had a blizzard? So... I set up the camera and I, I actually had to put it on. It was a long duration blizzard. So I yeah. put it on a on an external uh, power bank and just shot. And uh, it, it's wild to watch because you can see it on the, the, the deck table going, the snow growing. <laughs> and then you'd see, you know, someone come yeah. out, quickly shovel and the, the, go down the snow and then come back. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So storms on a whim, just photograph it. You can see the change in the light and, and so forth. It's very cool to watch. Compressed time is fascinating. Neat. Be cool. Well, thank you for all those ideas. And nope. I took I took a lot of notes. Um I it's gonna take a lot of rereading, you know, to 
to give it a shot. But I, I did want to say I really liked what you did. And I I liked the stacked images that you made from the time lapses. I would have never even thought to do that. I, I thought that was a really cool idea. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I tend to, when I'm left to my own devices, which is fairly often, I, I, I go down these rabbit holes and try things and then I'll go, oh, that's kind of cool. And I'll try something else. And that's how these weird things occur. So you can't break anything. Remember that. So just do it. <laughs> um, but thank you. Appreciate it. Curiosity. How much time have you, what's the longest time outside, outdoors, did you spend doing a time lapse? And how much wine did you drink? Oh, <laughs> let's see. Well, the wine's probably going to be affecting my recollection of how long the time <laughs> lapse was. <laughs> Kidding. No, um, probably four hours. Mm -hmm. I think four hours was my longest duration. And that was uh, on the beach doing the Milky Way. Mm. And with wine, yes. Because yes. that's the beauty of it. Once you set up your camera and your settings are set, you can just sit back and enjoy the show because this is something as photographers, we never get to do because we're so obsessed with getting the shot and we're not in the, you know, we're, we're in the moment of the camera, but we're not in the moment of the scene. So that's mm -hmm. the nice thing about time lapse is that you can actually enjoy seeing with your eyes and not just through that little viewfinder. Mm -hmm. so, Thank you. It was very enjoyable, your presentation. Thank you much kindly. Much appreciated. Much appreciated. Thank you so much. Glad you enjoyed it. Great job as always, which I knew it would be. Thank you, Beth. <laughs> no, thank you for inviting me. I really enjoyed it. It was great meeting okay. you guys. And yes, I'll send you me. notes. Yes. Okay. I would like to thank you very much for your time, uh, for your presentation. It was amazing. I loved it. Um, and thanks for answering the questions and everything. We really do appreciate it. And uh, I know you do a, another presentation on, uh, um, I forget, oh man, my mind went blank. Uh, that helped. Infrared? Huh? Infrared? infrared. Or yes, night. infrared, there it is. Or night photography, either one or something like that. So maybe in the future, we'll have you uh, do one of those presentations as well, because it was a very good presentation and I'm interested in 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 your other in your other stuff as well too. So, uh, we'll see. Maybe we can get you scheduled in for another one uh, in the maybe near future. We'll see here. Thank but, you. I'd love to come back. Thank yeah, you. We appreciate it, and you're welcome anytime. Just to pop in and hang out with us. We have our meetings and stuff, and I'll uh, I'll start throwing I'll throw your email on our list, and you can I'll send you invites to our meetings. And anytime you want, just pop right in. That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, we appreciate it. Oh, this was a lot of fun. Good, good. We appreciate it. And uh, I'm sure we're going to try some time lapse. I've done a few myself just um, with my GoPro, like uh, like DL mentioned there. Um, I was actually kind of looking for one of them. I have a video of one of our photography trips, the uh, driving part of going from uh, covered bridge to car. I see Beth starting to laugh. Going from covered bridge <laughs> to covered bridge. Uh, we did a covered bridge tour one time in Bedford County, Pennsylvania. And uh, I did a time lapse with the GoPro and the windshield of my vehicle driving uh, with the whole group of us driving. And um, it was it was kind of interesting. Everyone thought it was really funny when I was, I was looking for it. I wanted to show it, but I can't find it on this hard drive. I think it's on a different hard drive, but I'll come across it and and post yeah. it up again or something. But uh, yeah, I've really I, good. I've, I've messed around with them a little bit just, but again, just with the GoPro or with my phone itself, uh, which, you know, are... Uh, our iPhones and, and phones are capable of doing them too. So if you just want to try one, jump mm. in and try that, you know, grab your, grab your phone and do it and, and try a little one right out of the phone. It'll do it for you and then get your real camera out and do it the right way. <laughs> and the resolution you get with your real camera is nuts. I mean, the video that I, I have on, on the presentations, I have to show you like the, the lower resolution videos because of the bandwidth of Zoom and so forth. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you do it like a, a, a 4K video, which you can with your, your cameras, um, because these, these are very high resolution images, you can create an incredibly high resolution 
video. It's mind blowing at how detailed and excellent quality it is. So keep that in mind. It blows away a lot of vi actual video cameras and quality because of the quality that these cameras can output frame each frame. So it's pretty cool what it can do. All right. Well, we appreciate it. Thank you very much. No, nope, thank you. Presentation. It was nice meeting you guys. Yep, it was good thank to meet you, you, you too. All right. You. I'm going to bow out, and Beth, I'm going to send you the notes, and uh, hope to see you guys soon. Take care. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye -bye. Thank Bye -bye. you. All right, guys, that was a really good meeting. I appreciate mm -hmm. it. Good questions there at the end. Uh, I really don't have anything else uh, business-wise as far as uh, anything that I need to mention. I know we have a show coming up. I'm sure that Marty's probably going to mention that here in a moment. Um, yep. Uh, and uh, other than that, I really don't have anything. How How was the uh, photo walk to the museum? Cold. <laughs> Uh, it was nice. It was nice. Was it? Linda, you found your way out. <laughs> I Yeah, eventually. It may have taken a while, but yeah. <laughs> I kept getting lost in there. <laughs> she came up to me twice. She's like, I'm going in circles. How do I get out of here? <laughs> <laughs> I passed them like three times. And I'm At looking to go somewhere else. So I'm like, let me out of here. <laughs> it was good. Then we walked outside for a few minutes. And then it got too windy. And then we got, we, we left. But it was good. Yeah, it was windy all day uh, where I was at. Rebecca and Linda, uh, Pat and I were there, and then um, Rich and Jean Straw were there as well. Okay, good. All right, I I unfortunately had to miss it. I had a uh, another commitment that I had to go to out in Maryland, and on the way home, I drove in a blizzard snowstorm from uh, Lavelle, Maryland, to uh, the top of our mountain. Uh, wow. and like extremely wind blowing hard snowing uh very stressful drive home from where i was at so mm. uh, i think i'd have been better off going to the museum <laughs> well it was snowing horizontally here mm -hmm. there's that awesome tree across the street from the house i couldn't see it half the day yeah mm. well i couldn't see the end of the hood of my truck yeah, that's, that's on, on Route 68, um, at, <laughs> at literally driving behind snow plows at 20 mile an hour for miles and miles and miles. And it, it was snowing horizontally, straight down, straight up, left to right, <laughs> and right to left, all at the same time <laughs> on the way home. So it was, uh, it, was a, it was an interesting, uh, interesting drive. Um, okay, Marty, you got, uh, Got some information for us or anything you want to bring up? Sure. Um, titles are due March 25th. Um, anybody that's not paid, pay your dues so you can uh, join us in the show. Uh, and then um, right now I just have a couple people, so get those in. And then, uh, Rebecca, just a quick question. Did you put about the class and the show on Facebook or the website? I did the um, show, but I didn't see anything about the class on the um, newsletter. You want to just email it to me and I'll post it? Oh, it's on. Yeah, it's on the. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, I think, you just, I, think I may have overlooked it. But just... It is in the newsletter. It's um, yeah. the two columns together. Uh, oh, okay. I was looking there. Today, okay. On one side, and the uh, class is on the left. Okay, I wasn't looking on that page. Okay, I'll find it. And I'll post it. Oh, see, I'm going to put a mistake in on purpose to see if, how many people <laughs> read my newsletter. <laughs> um, I think that's it. We're going to be starting up um talk about uh, next month. So, come on out and join us. Um, the class starts the beginning of next month. Um, I think that's all I have. Okay. All right. Anybody else have anything they want to bring up? No? Okay. Um, 
we, uh, as as she said, the talk about will be coming up. Um, the planning can the planning officers and well the officers are going to meet on Wednesday evening to finish planning. So uh, we'll be having the rest of the, the rest of the year planned out and uh, all that kind of stuff and in the outings and everything. So that's all going to be coming up and be able to be posted here very shortly. We'll do our planning here uh, Wednesday evening and get every, get everything out to you guys. Um, and other than that, I really don't have anything else. Uh, if no one else has anything. We can call it an evening. It's, it's just about nine o'clock. So that was a really good presentation, Beth. I, we appreciate you uh, hooking us up with that uh, with her. Um, it was awesome. <clears throat> yeah, it was great. She's cool. I will. I will post this video. Uh, I'll try to get it posted either tonight or tomorrow uh, to our YouTube channel. Um, so if anybody wants to rewatch or anything, and did she she did ask us to keep it to a thirty day minimum. So uh, within uh, the the thirty, you know, after thirty days, I'll take the video back down because she didn't want it to to be up any longer than that. So if you want to rewatch this video of the tonight's meeting? You only have thirty days to do it from tomorrow when I post it. Uh, I did look up the uh, LR time lapse. Mm -hmm. uh, they are uh, LR time lapse six, and it looks like a personal or a private license for it is one hundred and nineteen dollars, from what I can see. Um, so Does it work without Lightroom? Uh, I don't no. think so. It seems like it's a pretty much. It's a like a plugin for Lightroom. That, okay. that relies on Lightroom. Yeah. Uh, but then I went to, uh, you know, where I'm a fan of DaVinci Resolve when it comes to video. And I went, can I do a time lapse in DaVinci Resolve? And I typed yeah, you it can. and it said, yeah, you sure can. And it gives you information and da DaVinci Resolve is free. So yeah. uh, maybe a opportunity for y'all to uh, venture into a little bit of video from DaVinci Resolve and fool around with that a little bit. So I think um, what um, that, that plugin will do for you is it, it it allows you to say say you were trying to do uh, a sunrise, so you have the exposures when the sun's down, and when it gets up so high, you have you have a completely different exposure. It will ramp the exposure between those times so that it looks even. I'm I'm sure there's po there's definitely positives to the time to that uh, program. <laughs> Um, but if you want to put something together and try it out before you spend $120 for the program. Well, she said it will do like 40 seconds of video. As long as you don't go longer than that, it's, you're fine. So what was it? Uh, 40 frames. 10 seconds or video, some 40 frames or something like that. Yeah, 40 or 400 frames. Yeah. So anyhow. Some thoughts. I'll do a little. I'm gonna do a little bit more research into that you know, as far as that goes, and in, in DaVinci Resolve too. So, all right, guys. I don't have anything else. If you guys don't have anything, we can call it an evening. Yeah, I'm good. Good night, all. All right. Good night. Appreciate y'all. Get your titles in. Good night. Good night. Get your titles in for the show. Once I figure out what I'm doing, yes, <laughs> mine are in. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Beth, for getting her, okay? She was very good. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Beth. Sure. I'll see you guys. Thank good you. Night. We'll see you guys. Bye. Bye.